through the my post um, and this is going to be two sessions the first session will be more of an intro to my coast and um, this is about the aspect of looking at king tides so what my coast is if you don't know um, by the end of this you will really is a portal to collect and analyze pictures um, and it's been it was developed in 2011 actually through one of the uh, the NOAA fellows, uh, Wes Shaw, who was in Massachusetts, and, um, and it's been used since then. And so um, by a couple, probably five or six different programs. And so, but it's not, not only about collecting pictures, it's about analyzing the pictures and the data. And I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, used to visualize the impact of coastal hazards and a variety of different kinds of hazards and to enhance awareness amongst decision makers. Um, I will just say, and stakeholders, I will say that when we started in 2011, it really did start as collecting pictures and it's come a whole lot more. And um, you'll see on my final slide that I see some real great opportunities. Um, so for those of you who don't know, what is my coast? So my coast is um, a, as I told you, a kind of a tool that's available through um, cell phone and through through website to help chronicle our changing coast. It involves citizens. It brings in different science of, you know, citizen science of uh, what's going on on the shore. It is coastal, um, although there are um, different elements right now that are being worked on for inland, and I'll, I could describe those more if you want. So if you want to know. Um, it's more, it's not only pictures, it's data and it's collecting this. And so um, here is just a typical report on king tides. And you'll see that you have a location um, identified and this is all the information that's available. Really look at the title overview um, and it goes to many different, um, your closest tide, NOAA tide station. So really good information provides weather, um, which is really important. You know, did we have winds that day or rainfall so that you could go back and uh, analyze this. Um, in our case, we have a very um, high uh, resolution mapping on sea level rise and storm surge. And so you could actually click right there um, on, you know, in your uh, app and you could get to see a picture of what sea level rise would look like in that spot. And finally, like I indicated, um, it's a mobile app and um, also can be done if somebody wants to upload a picture. So it really needs to decide, you really need to decide what are your goals and then you can choose a tool. Um, you know, is it, is it about looking at high tides? Is it about storm damage? Um, and in this case, we also have living shorelines. And so in Rhode Island, we have three tools activated. So they're separate tools. Uh, the king tides, the storm reporter, and the coastal resilience. But in other states, um, they have these other ones, creosote pilings, um, trying to identify those and uh, geotagging them, similar for abandoned boats, um, and beach litter. So you could see that there's geotagging and collection of photos as well as, um, as, well as data really could provide some um, broad usage depending upon what your goals are. So as I said, it's not only pictures, it really is um, a rich and accessible database. Some of this database is open to all the users, but other is, you know, some of the more detailed stuff is open to um, state administrators. Like in my, in my case in Rhode Island, um, we have the Coastal Resources Management Council, our CZM agency, and myself and um, one of our big nonprofits as the data manager. So we could access this information. So here you could see all of these different high tide um, photos that have been taken um, and you could scroll in there more and see them very much more um, uh, you know, in a bigger way to see how many pictures have been taken. Here you could download these reports um, and you could download them by the location, the reporter, or a starter end date. So you could download that information. Basically, it would give you a report 
um, as well as the photographs and all of that information that I talked about with regards to the tides and the weather. Um, it also, this is for state administrators, it gives you all of this information uh, that you could manage. So all of this information is available to you from you know, pulling out um, who is logging in and when they're logging in or if they're logging in to, um, you know, I have a problem here in Wickford. I really wanna look at the parking lot. Let's hone in on that and let's download those high quality um, photos um, for that. So who's engaged? So um, as I pointed out, citizens um, mostly are engaged um, in identifying in going out and taking photos. Uh, however, we also have municipal state and university staff uh, going out and taking photos for a variety of different reasons. On the right here, you could see, and actually I believe Teresa's on the, the call, Teresa Crean is working with uh, the town of Warren and the town manager there and the planners are really interested in this location because of its uh, recurring flooding. So they've been going out on a regular basis and taking those pictures, uploading them and then using them because they wanna to start to talk about uh, retreat and relocation. Um, you could see here on the right, as I pointed out, this is that ac the uh, access to the storm tool. So you, they could start to see what the sea level rise will look like. So this arms them with the information that they want to use uh, in decision making. So building awareness um, and political will amongst uh, um, both citizens as well as um, staff and decision makers, um, informing some of the decisions and planning, um, planning discussions that they need to have, let it be in a planning board meeting or a zoning board or uh, long-term planning like they've been looking at here in, in um, Warren. Down here uh, in this larger photo where you could see this parking lot, um, this is one of our first uh, spots that we've highlighted since 2011. And that is an area that continues to flood from um, having stormwater, uh, stormwater drain um, coming up during high tides. And so this has really helped uh, the community of North Kingstown and the village of Wickford really start to identify some of the key issues and be able to get some funding about how might they uh, retrofit this and or do uh, green infrastructure to help minimize some of the other impacts. Um, so, you know, in, in the end of the day, we use this a lot to say, these are your extreme tides today, but these will be your daily tides in the future. So um, that's our key message. Um, so where is it going? So we're really taking this from project to program. It's been my coast all along, a lot of that, and we want to start to add Coast Snap um, and some of these other tools, potentially um, uh, more signage. And so we would like to do that. And that's what we're, uh, we're kind of looking at our Coastal Commons, uh, Rhode Island project to do that. Um, we want to take it from people being photographers to stewards. We very much recognize that we can't um, work with every single community in a deep way, but this might be a way to start to get stewardship uh, in, their in the neighborhood, which could then help support their community. Um, moving it from one way to two way communication instead of um, the uh, participants just sharing and for sharing pictures with us. How can we really start to um, have two-way communication and support them in what they need to do to become good stewards? And this is where I'm hoping that we'll get more of the knowledge from this group on citizen uh, science, um, because lots of uh, ideas would be, would be a good one. Um, expansion of partners, um, going from the three institutions that we have to expand to several other uh, groups here in Rhode Island, that has shown interest in the data as well as um, the tool for outreach. And you know, really starting to see how could we really expand the partnership so that the program will be more vibrant and robust for, for the state. And the other reason is to help support some funds. This tool costs uh, $10,000 a year. So that's around $800 a month. And to be able to have somebody else to text to and call and say, can you please add this or, gee, what's wrong with that? Or, um, you know, 
can you help me think out a new um, a new idea on how to do outreach on my coast? Having um, Blue Urchin out in Oregon do that has been wonderful. And um, so that's where that's where we're going here. Um, and so I will just say, um, I'll leave it at that. And I believe so my name is Katie Graziano, for those who I haven't met yet. Um, and I'm a coastal resilience specialist with New York Sea Grant, and I'm based in New York City, specifically around Jamaica Bay in Brooklyn and Queens. And I coordinate the Flood Watch program, which I took over in July. So I'm relatively um, somewhat new to it, but mm, that's more important in the sense that a lot of what Flood Watch is was kind of handed over to me, and there's room for improvement, and I'm very open to suggestions um, and ways to kind of advance Flood Watch. So um, Flood Watch came out of the recognition that tidal flooding is happening in New York City. Um, but there was, before Flood Watch existed, there was no way to collectively gather information from residents about what they were experiencing. Um, and so we, so we, we, generally think of it as a very community driven project in that it came out of originally like social media and um, community needs assessments and things like that where um, from from this from the get go, it was community members who were helping to drive the creation of a program where they could better gather and share information about their experiences. Um, and so the the flood reporting tool that we use, um, we just started using this summer. And up until then it was all kind of manu man everything was manually entered into a database. Um, but, but since the summer we started pushing people to use this tool, which is a survey one, two, three form connected to ArcGIS. Um, it's very basic. It's just a place to enter photos, um, water depth, um, time, location, et cetera maybe some extra details if you're interested in putting in extra details. So that it's just um, it's just a website, you can either access it on your phone or go to your desktop and enter everything manually. And then that will automatically, the information will automatically pop up, pop up on this flood map viewer where you can access that information through there. Um, and so the flood watch tool itself is, it, that's, that's kind of like the bread and butter of flood watch, but um, more importantly, we think of it as this conversation or like knowledge exchange between residents, government, and scientists. Um, because, and, and each of these kind of three key players have something to offer the program and they also gain something out of it. Um, and so, we, so for, for residents, they're offering up their local knowledge and they're, they're taking their time to volunteer these flood reports. Um, but by participating in Flood Watch, they gain access to more government resources related to flooding, um, emergency alerts. Um, I send out an email blast when there's um, when we're expecting flooding in low-lying neighborhoods. Um, and then on top of that, they also now have access to data that's kind of like evidence that essentially their neighbors have gathered that helps them communicate to decision makers what kind of um, issues they're seeing and what visions they have for their own community. So that's the resident piece. Um, the scientist or, or researcher piece, um, we partner very closely with the Stevens Institute of Technology who they have a pretty cutting edge flood forecast system. Um, and so that's where I normally get my information about when to expect flooding. And that's what we share with residents um, to, to prompt them to select to uh, do a flood report. Um, but then also in return, or the scientists or the researchers are taking this flood data and using it to validate their models and to improve their forecasting. Um, and then finally, the last piece, the government piece, we, we um, the, the New York City Mayor's Office of Resiliency is one of our main partners and they have a very strong interest in Flood Watch um, and in the data that's coming out of it. Um, so they, like I said, they, the government agencies offer uh, resources and, and Flood Watch has become sort of an avenue for communication between government and residents, especially in neighborhoods where there's a lot of distrust since, since the response to Hurricane Sandy. Um, but in addition to that, the government, like the mayor's office, the, the New York City 
Office of Emergency Management um, are using flood watch reports to get a better understanding of what's happening on the ground and then using that to pinpoint areas where interventions are necessary and to help um, kind of collaboratively come up with low cost solutions like improved hazard um, warnings or signage or like different, tr different traffic flows or different transportation um, alternatives during flood events and things like that. So th this is all very preliminary, but this is kind of the interest that the mayor's office and the other city agencies have in the data that's coming out of flood watch. Um, and so yeah, that was a really quick overview. Our next step, so this really started off in Jamaica Bay um, communities and we're trying to expand it to broader New York City, so like the Bronx, Coney Island. Um, and in doing so, it's become a bit of a challenge because our data management system isn't isn't perfect. Um, and so for me, data management for scalability is really important. Um, meanwhile, we have this parallel effort to put in flood sensors in, in certain neighborhoods and um, and and so, that's becoming a really interesting piece where the flood sensors can kind of work in tandem with community reports to validate models um, and to help improve communication about hazards. Um, with all that, there's a push for better data visualization and communication other than just that map. Um, we want something that's more useful for communities to be able to communicate what's happening in their neighborhood. And finally, this is, a little bit of a tangent, but also kind of critical in certain ways is that we want to integrate the collection of social impacts data. So when people are filling out surveys or maybe somehow when they're participating in flood watch, figure out a way to collect even qualitative data about their lived experiences and and fill and like kind of like put that into the city response to flooding. Okay, and that's it. So that was it. so hopefully that was quick enough. So um, this one is about Storm Reporter. We, I will preface this by, so this is one of the three tools we have, as well as they have it in Massachusetts um, and all of the, all of the states. Um, this is one that we use, um, but not as frequently as the tidal flooding. So Storm Reporter, um, so this is where citizens and agency staff engage, similar to what we were speaking about before of some staff were taking it, some citizens are taking it. Um, this is in partnership with our um, Coastal Zone Management Program, the Coastal Resources Management Agency, um, and the National Weather Service. So they were really interested in trying to understand, um, you know, similar to what Katie was speaking about, Where's the, you know, trying to help validate some of the uh, damage um, with their models and such. And um, so the program obviously promotes rapid delivery and archival of storm damage, like we talked about earlier, um, and opportunities to analyze post storm conditions and expedite recovery. I do know that in um, Massachusetts, well, Greg, you probably could speak a little bit, um, you might know more about that, but. Um, you know, where it's used by emergency management officials and, and such to help identify some of those areas during a storm and then after a storm. Um, and you could see here from the map, um, so these, you could start to identify what is being reported and if there's damage or not. And um, it's, the data information is really quite useful. So this actually is showing um, a property after Superstorm Sandy. And again, we don't use this one as much, but I think that we need to um, enhance it. This is on the on the app where, you know, you take a picture and you say, I wanna do a storm report. And then do you have impacts to report or not? And it gives you a variety of different um, things that you might have impacts to. And once you hit the, the yes button, it opens it up to um, some more information. So in this case, what was reported was there was water around the building, there was damaged stairs and decks and, um, and walls and roof. And in addition to um, some, some comments about the septic systems. So that's the damage report that you add in. And then of course, that information is available. This information that you're seeing here is public to everyone. 
so everyone could see this kind of information and then it could be downloaded into the um, into the Excel uh, formula like I, I talked about before by uh, state administrators. So similarly, we have all of that same um, data interface as we did before. Um, something that I that I would love to share also that I honestly did not realize um, that this was all available on the phone app. Um, and this is a way to keep users engaged during, you know, at all times where you could just really check out what are the tides near me and what is the time of high tide, low tide, um, and it gives you those um, that inf information. So that is in the in the app um, once again to keep them engaged uh, even between high tides or storms. Um, so our goals in the future there really are to enhance our partnerships on that, you know, reconnect with the National Weather Service and such to try to clarify the goals and really see if this is useful um, and to expand the usage because, um, and we have to reach out to the users because some users are really confused about when do you put in a high tide? When do you put in a, a storm reporter? And uh, there's no damage, but do you put that, you know, is that from a high tide because we had a high tide and a nor'easter? You know, so some clarification of that kind of information. So, um, um, and to learn from, I think, Massachusetts and then perhaps from, from New York, how best to use these. So that's where we're going on this one. Give me a thumbs up. We see our uh, CoSnap. Okay, cool. So this is CoSnap and just a tiny bit of picture post because we kind of looked at both of them when we were evaluating what we wanted to do. So when we're looking at this slide over on the left is CoSnap to the right is picture post. You can see on the left that these CoSnaps are typically metal, fairly substantial brackets. Over on the right, the picture posts are wood, uh, certainly cheaper to make, uh, but don't last nearly as well. So this particular slide, I'm uh, discussing why we chose one over the other. And honestly, our local NER, Wakoit Bay National Estuary Research Reserve, has several picture posts going on. So I was able to chat with them. Um, and they have lost some of the wooden posts, whether due to destruction or kids going out there or something. But uh, so that has been an issue. The co-snaps, um, while any vandalism is still possible, it takes a much more dedicated vandal to take off one of those. Uh, typically stainless or anodized aluminum. Another rationale was uh, how you actually upload the pictures because this is uh, at its core a camera cradle system and then the fancy stuff gets done on the back end. With picture post, you have to log in, right? So this is something that um, you either have to uh, log in in the field or have downloaded it beforehand. And one thing that Webner did to try to avoid that was they actually posted their login and password for themselves on this picture post, uh, which in my mind is a little uh, <laughs> uh, nerve wracking when you give that kind of authority to, to everybody out there. Um, but with the CoSnap, uh, people just hashtag it on Twitter or Instagram. They can post it on Facebook or email it. So there's nothing they need to do beforehand. Uh, when you're talking about who's using these kinds of systems, it, it's our thought that it's people who are uh, opportunistic, right? People just happen to be walking by. It's not like they sat in their house and downloaded the app and like, okay, now I'm gonna go out and find them. So this was something that we wanted people to be able to just walk by and say, oh, okay. And click it, hashtag it, or something they already have on their phone. Uh, the picture post seems much more uh, widely distributed in the US. The CoSnap started in Australia, so there's more of an international presence. Um, again, with the picture post, you can kind of see in that upper right hand corner, there's many different angles you can shoot from uh, versus CoSnap is one angle. Uh, it's a little bit easier for us, but uh, the picture post has a nice auto slideshow system. 
and, and in fact, I mean, maybe Lisa would want to talk about this some other time, but uh, UNH is, and the Sea Grant is involved in some way with picture post out there. Um, moving on. So this started in Australia, 2017. It's branched out. Uh, I think there's still quite a few more picture posts than there are co snaps. Um, but we went with this one. Here's our Facebook page. We we're trying to kind of do an economy of scale with this particular grant that we got for the regional sea grant. So we have a kind of a homepage for all the Northeast coast snaps that may come out of this. Uh, and then we can kind of branch out and distribute as we see fit. The main idea behind the uh, blueprints down there is I can't just hand you a post. Um, this is something that's going to get attached to a four by four or four by six, usually on a railing, but you need to do your pitch and your yaw measurement, right? So is it gonna be angled? Is it gonna be looking up or down? And once you do that, it gets manufactured. As part of this particular uh, grant that we received, I think we did put funding in. So every uh, program in the Northeast will be given a co-snap frame. So you'll just need to get in touch with me about our pitch and yaw and uh, Steph and I are going to be coming up with some uh, management, uh, uh, best management practices for installation, some signage that you guys can template off of and that sort of thing. And that, that's not saying that this is the only system out there, but it's the one we're working with already. We already have a site installed. Here it is in the town of Sandwich. Town of Sandwich has a coastal resilience program uh, talking about how it's coming. Well, it actually got installed a few weeks ago. So it's up and running and we've been getting uh, pictures posted. <laughs> We're getting uh, uh, snaps of our coast, I guess is more accurate. So what else is going on in the future? Well, there's expansion, right? So there's international efforts. It's mostly Australia. Uh, and that Australian agency that started this has uh, converted or created an app for it, fairly substantial app with a manual, everything you would need to know. Uh, there's uh, a lot of interesting things in the app. I'm not going to get into it too much. Uh, we still have to figure out whether we're going to, oh, we can certainly tell people about the app, but the whole idea was opportunistic. And if you have to download the app ahead of time, it's kind of defeating that. But if it drives, you know, repeated people coming out, because that is one thing about any of these is um, during the summer when people walk by, you're going to get a lot of snaps. And then during the winter, you're not going to get as much. So if you happen to have somebody who lives in the neighborhood and downloads the app and goes out, it might be more valuable for that sort of thing. And then our particular efforts at expanding it is we'd like to have more coast snaps and wider distribution, certainly amongst the Northeast, uh, more people knowing about it, the better. And what else can we do? So we're gonna have a coast snap frame. Is there any instrumentation we can install on it? Uh, we're in talks with some of the Hui engineers right now uh, with regards to a relatively cheap LIDAR sensor that you could install on there and measure uh, periodically or continuously during a storm to see what kind of water and wind elevations are actually driving erosion and creating some kind of cross section like that. So in a nutshell, if I can stop sharing, that uh, that is CoSnap. <laughs>